There we go. Well, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead, and I'm uh, privileged today. It's taken us a while to get this scheduled, but uh, I have, uh, Stephen, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, Boulevard? Yes, perfectly. I got it. Stephen holds, Don't get that uh, very often. Yeah, holds professional positions at St. Mary's University of London and the University of Notre Dame, Sydney. He has doctorates in theology and sociology. His studies of contemporary non-religiosity have received wide international coverage, including from the BBC, New York Times, Economist, Financial Times, and Der Spiegel. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, I'll hold it up here, his book, Nonverts, The Making of X, Christian America, for those watching the YouTube version. Great book, Stephen. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Sorry to get you up so early to do this. Oh, that's all right. We do what we have to do for the craft, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd like to begin when I with my guests, usually on, on a personal. How did you develop? There have been uh, a few volumes. I've had a few guests here talking about the nuns. You're calling them nonverts here uh, with your focus. What, what was your personal as well as professional interest in covering this subject matter? Yeah, so this is a... Uh, I kind of started doing this kind of sociology of atheism, non-religiosity. Uh, when I was doing, meant to be doing a, a doctorate in theology, but also on atheism and kind of the, the Catholic Church's pastoral and intellectual engagement with atheism and non-belief in the 20th century. Um, and I was just interested to see what sociology of that subject was out there and there wasn't terribly much at the time this is about 15 years ago um but also it was at a time when the new atheism was suddenly kind of a big thing it was a time when we were starting to get these kind of pew reports saying you know non's on the rise um and so there was a little growing group of uh kind of younger scholars becoming interested in this as a topic and uh doing bits and then you know getting good feedback and you know doing more so it's all kind of escalated out of that and really the the american rise of the nons has been kind of like one of the big stories that that you know we we talk about a lot and as i say this this book is my attempt to offer my my sort of three-dimensional um uh ex exploration and explanation i guess of the phenomenon yeah what one of the interesting things for me about your book is your treatment of uh atheism within the broader grouping of the nuns. Uh, and when, when I see media reporting, I see usually they'll lead with that. Uh, and then they'll talk about another spirituality sometimes. But what is the, do you have any numbers for the, the specific breakdown? How many atheists are make up the nuns? What, oh, yeah. what kind of diversity are we talking about? Not, within not, not a huge proportion. I mean, if you look at the American nuns, so this is the people who, you know, when asked, what is your religion, if any, tick no religion. Um, it's only around a third of those who will tick one of the sort of the classic atheist or agnostic categories. And probably only around 10, 15 percent who are ticking, you know, I definitely don't believe in God. Um, but what you tend to see is there's this huge spectrum. So there's people in there who say, I definitely believe in God and never have any doubts about it. There's a lot of people in there who just don't know not sure sometimes do sometimes don't um and and there's quite a big proportion of people who kind of affirm a something a kind of a there's a benevolent probably benevolent kind of something out there that i don't think about too much but i'm certainly don't equate it with a kind of a robust uh theologically worked out version of a god or gods um but yeah there's there's a there's a something um and so when we talk about the nons we're talking about a huge spectrum of kind of uh theological kind of conviction but equally you know if we did a study of america's christians you're gonna see a, a, a pretty broad spectrum and, and and diversity of what people actually believe including you know even among the people who are actually going to church on a sunday yeah yeah i think that's true we we assume uh, quote unquote orthodoxy on the part of a lot of people. But uh, I, I think it's much like the biblical tradition where the text itself is trying to put forward an orthodoxy, but the people were all over the place. That's, well, yeah, and you, this comes through the text yeah. all the time. Right. I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Another interesting part about the, the book for me was uh, looking at the stories of people. Um, you know, we get bombarded with statistics and, and all that is very helpful. 
But it's also helpful to remember that these are, are people who are on, on journeys. And, and that journey is an important part that you discuss in the book. What was your research process that you used? So, yeah, so this is, you're right that we, we've got, we bank, I mean, America is probably the best, well, is the best served country in the world for this. And, you know, not only do you have a, you know, serious polling companies and, uh, you know, long running academic surveys, but you've got people like Pew who are specifically interested in. So in terms of the kind of the the numbers, we've got a pretty good skeleton of, of the phenomenon, of all sorts of kind of, you know, phenomena. Um, but what we don't have is the flesh to put on that skeleton. Um, and so it was always necessary for a book like this. Yes. What do we know from serious surveys? And especially when we're talking about trends over time, they're critical. Um, but actually, there's there's no replacement for going and, and talking to people. And, and then also, given the, the broad range, and one of the things I was very keen to do in the book is to not just think about these people as nons, but to think about these people as um, a large proportion of them, nons who used to be somethings, who, used to, who were raised religious, which is around a kind of, two thirds, three quarters of American nuns say they were raised in some kind of religion. Um, and, and then to look at, well, how do those different religious backgrounds um, affect people's nonness? Um, so the, the really nice thing about this project uh, was to be able to travel around. And I mean, I interviewed about 50 odd people um, all, all over the country um, and a couple of research assistants interviewed maybe a 10 or a dozen each as well. So we were trying to get a really kind of broad spectrum of non-experiences, both geographically, age, sex, ethnicity, you know, all the classic categories, but also that, you know, how does this look different if you're raised evangelical? How does it look different if you're raised mainline, if you're raised Mormon, if you're raised Catholic? And, and then the diversity within each of those groups anyway, because they're all pretty big kind of, you know, silos to kind of pigeonhole people. Uh, so, yeah. A lot of well, sitting in bars, uh, asking people <laughs> to tell me that literally to tell me, yeah, like, you yeah. know, tell me their life stories. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, I was uh, intrigued by one of the books you mentioned in your bibliography. Uh, it's I can't remember the exact title, The Process of Role Exit, uh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I encountered that book years ago. I put together a resource to help people who have made the choice to come out of Mormonism and to gravitate instead towards a more mainstream uh, Christian Protestantism. And I found that book very helpful because we're dealing with people, as you know, in your book, who, who are an ex. And yep. that's very different than someone. It's like in a, a marital situation, someone who's single who, or who has always been married is going to be very different in the way they approach relationships than someone who has an ex. Yeah. Can you talk to the importance of these roles, the, the, how that continues to define people as they go through this process. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of the, the, one of the big master ideas of the book. I mean, the book's called Nonverts, and the idea is very much that, you know, the, they're not just nons, but one, I think one of the, the really interesting things, and just with how fast it's happened in America, is this high proportion of nons, you know, aren't raised that way. They've, they've come from somewhere. They've, they've been on some kind of journey to get there. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, you know, in all sorts of ways, you know, to be a recovering alcoholic is, is a statement about one's present identity and, and you know, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, you know, it's not simply a, a statement about the past, but, it, you know, more positively to be a veteran, um, you know, is is making, a, you know, sets one apart from all the other people who aren't currently in the military. Um, so there's all sorts of ways that, you know, that the, the past is is coloring people's presence and and this affects people in different ways i mean there are you know big there have been psychological studies done that show that people there's a the kind of a religious residue effect so you know on average people who were raised religious and certainly different types of religious tend to be different in various ways politically morally in terms of religious beliefs that kind of stuff um but also the really interesting thing for me was to to see, you know, how are nuns who were raised evangelical, you know, how as a they differ among themselves, but as a group, you know, they are very different from those who were raised mainline Protestants. You know, people who were raised who were raised Mormon who are now nuns. Um, you know, there's a coherence to that to those people as a group. Um, you know, there's, there's a huge spectrum of different stories within that, um, but there's still this kind of shared commonality. Um, and, and, 
it was interesting to see how different groups are you know mormons and evangelicals um look fairly similar partly because i mean in all sorts of different ways but because to become a non having been raised in you know small town texas as a southern baptist or small town utah as a mormon to get from there to being a non um there's been a big often personal um often fairly traumatic often uh certainly it's been a big deal to to go from that background to to thinking of oneself as having no religion now and it's probably also quite a a current reality in terms of one's relationships with family and friends um possibly with spouses possibly with ex-spouses um you know there's a whole there's a lot that gets kind of packaged along with that whereas for ex-mainline protestants you know it, it's very rare to find anyone who really has a particular story to tell um you know it's uh, and it's certainly not this kind of big deal uh, you know when they all meet together at thanksgiving you know with with family because you know it, it might be that there's one of their cousins who still goes to church and he's he's the weird religious one whereas if you're the only one who no longer goes to church then even if no one talks about it then it's this kind of you know um issue uh and, and so that was one of the interesting ways because obviously you know people aren't just individuals people are still in relationships with families with friends with you know their home with their pasts um and that's one of the other things that really comes up with this kind of uh x effect um, as i think i call it yeah it's been interesting to see the response of some of my fellow churchmen to uh, the nuns. There's, there's been this, as you know, tendency to dismiss. Uh, some have said that uh, it's really just those who weren't really seriously committed, uh, this kind of a thing. For me, it's, it's almost like a form of cognitive dissonance. We really don't need to worry about it. The house isn't on fire. Can you talk a little bit about the growth of the nuns? And you've got a, an interesting theory as to why it has become more socially acceptable, which may contribute to more reporting. Can yeah, you go into so, some of that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the growth is really, you know, religious change in societies tends not to happen that quick. I mean, it'll happen gradually. OK, um, you know, you might get a very small group that suddenly leaps up because of a big immigration thing or something like that. But, at a, you know, a national level, you tend to get slow a couple of percent, you know, over a generation, that kind of stuff. Maybe a bit more dramatic than that. But, you know, in America, you know, the, the proportion of nons, um, you know, has been single digits right through the 20th century until about the, depending on what survey you take, kind of probably the mid 90s, late 90s. And then every year it's gone up and it's gone up and it's gone up and it's gone up. So from kind of, you know, seven, eight percent 25 years ago to what it's about uh, a quarter or a third of American adults now. Um, it's really, really, you know, kind of, you know, it's no surprise if people feel this kind of like cultural whiplash with some of these issues. Um, and so one of the things that uh, is really striking, uh, for first of all, I think you have to just go back to what you said before, this thing about cognitive dissonance. Um, I mean, I think it's absolutely right. I mean, there's there's one way of framing this, and it's just to say, well, all this is is that people who used to, people who don't practice and don't believe used to tick Christian and now they don't tick Christian and there's no kind of other change than that and it's just a purely and and there's a sense in which you know a, a significant proportion of the nons you know you, do, you don't suddenly shift from being you know Sunday believing everything Christian to, to being a non the next Sunday right so it is absolutely true that for a large proportion of these people there has been this kind of phase transition which isn't to say however that you know a lot of the these people didn't used to be absolutely committed absolutely involved absolutely believing and and in fact you know we've got the statistics to show this um, but also, I mean, the, the biggest story there is that, well, it's a very different world in which people who are non-practicing and non-believing still tick the box. Um, you know, that tells you a lot about the overall climate and temperature and atmosphere, if you like, of a society um, when suddenly those people stop ticking the box. And, and one of the things I wanted to uh, kind of lay out um, and kind of add my own um 
amended version to other uh, theories floating out there is this, well, why did it happen? You know, uh, what is it that triggers this rise of the norms when it happens? Um, but also for me, you know, one of the big stories has always been, well, why didn't it happen anytime sooner? Because if you look at all sorts of other, no, no country in the world is comparable to America. Um, but of the sort of the quasi comparisons, you know, the nons has been a big thing for decades, right? Um, and I guess there's all sorts of things that play into this in the 1960s, in, you know, the growing uh, the sexual revolution, the growing sort of rift between what you might call traditional Christian morality on the one hand and kind of where the culture is generally on the other. And that's only been getting wider and wider. Um, all sorts of issues arising out of the 60s and the rise of the baby boomers and, you know, that just had that kind of whole turbulence, you know mainline and catholic churches especially you know have been seeing you know attendance falling fairly steadily over the past 30 40 years it's not kind of come out of nowhere and um, but i think one of the big things for me was looking at american history and well what's different in america that you don't see in other kind of western uh you know industrialized democracies and one of the things i zone in on in the book is this um the cold war um, you know, we, we had a Cold War here. Um, you know, we were up to our necks in it. Um, but it wasn't framed in religious terms as it was in America. There wasn't this kind of Christian America versus godless communism equivalent in, in Europe. Um, it just wasn't thought about in those terms. And, and you know, in God we trust is added, you know, becomes the official motto of the states in the 50s. You know, under God is added to the pledge of the 50s. Um, it's only with Kennedy that American presidents start uh, citing the city on a hill sermon of John Winthrop, um, you know, which then becomes a big thing with Reagan, you know, with shining, you know, um, the shining city on a hill. That kind of uh, religio political framing uh, is quite distinctive in America. And, and I, my argument, at least, is that, well, what that does, it kind of stigmatizes thinking of oneself as non religious. Um, and it kind of dampens down thinking of oneself as being atheist or non-religious, uh, you know, because of this kind of implicit associate, implicit or explicit association with kind of anti-Americanism. And then in the late 90s, uh, the Cold War ends. Um, the new American enemy uh, is people with too much religion rather than not enough religion. Um, and you've got this generation, the millennials are really the vanguard of the rise of the nons. And, you know, this is a generation who are, you know, largely raised after the Cold War, who are seeing a very different world. And, you know, 9-11 is one of the, the, you know, the massive crowning moments, not crowning, but kind of definitive moments for them um, in their upbringing. Um, the Internet's coming, which if you've been raised in quite a kind of robust subculture like evangelicals or mormons you know the the internet is this real kind of uh um world opening thing um so you've got this kind of combination of factors um that coalesce in the late 90s um plus once the rise of the nons becomes a headline once that becomes a thing you then get people who read those headlines and think oh I guess that's what I am. And then the next time the survey comes around, they'll tick it. And then the kind of the process continues. So the argument is, is that there was almost a kind of a pent up demand um, that kind of least gets sparked in the late 90s. And it's still going. Yeah, it's a fascinating idea. <clears throat> it, it, I live in, in Utah. I don't uh, belong to the dominant religious tradition, but it's been fascinating living here as something of an outsider. I was pleasantly surprised to see you start your book with uh, an exploration of the Latter-day Saints. Why did you start with that group? Uh, partly, I just find them, I just find them interesting. I find them fascinating. Um, <laughs> I, there's a particular, you know, when you're trying to structure a book like this, you know, there's certain stories, certain anecdotes that you kind of want to, you know, emphasize it. And there's a particularly uh, good story that a former LDS told me that I thought might, might help hook readers. 
Um, but more than that, I mean, the the reason why the sort of the more fundamental reasons why I lead with the Latter Day Saints, despite them being so small and despite them being, you know, um, uh, um, distinct compared to the the rest of kind of the American Christian landscape, um, is because a there's an argument for saying, you know, like the Latter Day Saints, you know, have always done well at, you know, kind of having lots of kids, raising them, you know, and having that kind of pipeline into the next generation, you know, and, and good youth ministry and and all that, um, in such that other churches always looked to them and said, well, obviously there's lots lots there that we wouldn't want to copy, but actually we, we'd love to kind of get those numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so the fact that the Latter-day Saints are now worried about we're losing the young, you know, we're, we're you know, we did everything right as parents, um, and yet, you know, three of our seven kids are now nuns. Um, you know, if those sorts of issues are affecting the Latter Day Saints and, and also evangelicals, um, then this kind of really stresses just how how big a deal it's become across the whole country. And also, I think that a lot of the other themes that come up later in the book to do with this kind of erosion of uh, subcultures and that kind of stuff. The Latter-day Saints are just a sort of a a clear example of some of those trends. Um, so it was nice to be able to kind of, a bit like an overture in an opera, you know, to be able to kind of like raise various themes that would come up later, um, but to be able to do that in quite a clear way in, in quite a sort of a smaller contained case study, um, which you can do the Latter-day Saints. You know, you try to talk about American evangelicalism. It's a very, I mean, it's a very broad and diverse thing. Um, you try and talk about the mainline even more so. Even Catholicism is, is hugely diverse, whereas the Latter-day Saints is sort of neater and allows you to tell quite a, 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 a much more kind of coherent narrative, which is good early on because it then sets out some clear themes and ideas to then pick up later on in the book. Uh, this is just a, a quick follow-up question, kind of an aside, if you would have any thoughts. In my experience with the Latter-day Saints, and particularly former Latter-day Saints, the nonverts, it's interesting, even those who may at times make the tra- attempt to transition into a more mainstream form of Christianity, many times they still, that's kind of a way station, they still end up moving toward atheism. It's almost as if if one is committed to the idea that this is the one true religion and one then discovers that that doesn't hold up, that that's, that's it. You know, we're not going to try anything else. Uh, I've seen that with also, I think with many ex evangelicals, do you, is that kind of a, a thing for some of the nonverts? I think, it, I mean, it's an interesting thing that you say that um, I think that there's a couple of things going on there. One is simply that if you've had a kind of a very, uh, deep and intensive experience um, of religion, then there's there's more to react against. So you're going to get a higher proportion of people who have definitively left and, 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 you know, want no part in in that kind of thing again. It's very difficult to find those kind of stories among the mainliners. You know, very few have had a real kind of robust kind of intense uh, dose of religion to really (laughs) react against. Right um so but i think also i mean there is this ecclesiological thing you see with catholics as well um to a lesser extent um but but there is that kind of you know there used to be this kind of once a catholic always a catholic type thing which certainly isn't true anymore um but there was also this sense that like you know if not a catholic then nothing you know like there's there's this kind of uh you're either you're either in or you're completely out um and and i think you probably get that kind of thing with certain yeah religions where there's quite a a strong claim of distinctiveness and uniqueness and and uh truth um you know if 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 there's an ecclesiology which you get in many mainline churches that you know yeah you know we think we're right but you know to be honest you know being a methodist or being a congregationalist or being an whatever is is all is all good too um then it's easier to then transition to one of those. Um, right. You know, if you've been raised <laughs> with a kind of, it's kind of, it's us or nothing, um, then you say, okay, or nothing. Um, 
So that, that again, but that's that's another you know one of these kind of X effects that we're talking about that kind of religious residue. Um, you know, there's a kind of a uh, the the ingraining of that idea, even for those who leave, kind of testify to the you know kind of testify to the truth of it. You know, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's a fact fascinating dynamic um, it would make for an interesting study in its own right just to do a deep dive in that area my audience is uh has some diversity in it but it's largely evangelical trying to help them understand the current religious landscape so i would be remiss and not asking you about uh non-verts who used to be evangelical what, what kinds of dynamics have you discovered that that led to that journey yeah well this is another big one and, and one of the striking things i think and, and again I, you know i mentioned the lds you know if the lds are having a problem with this then you know clearly it's a it's a big issue uh, the same is true of evangelicals i mean you know evangelical bookstores and i don't know how many are left after the pandemic but you know it's quite obvious that there's this new subgenre of books about prodigals you know praying your prodigal back home help i have a prodigal that there's a whole industry of books specifically targeting this market of you know um i expect mainly moms who feel they've done everything right and yet their kids you know have left the church and you know don't know what they believe if anything and identify as nuns and all that kind of stuff and of course you know to frame them as prodigals is a hopeful thing right because you know, you know right. prodigals the, the prodigal son comes back right <laughs> um but it, it, it it's striking to me that there's you know if, if there's a, it's not just one book but there's lots of books then you know there's clearly a, a big enough market to sustain that um so and again you know american evangelicalism has been one of the great success stories of the past kind of you know 50 years you know the main line and the catholics were going down the evangelicals you know were were very strong so again the fact that this is an issue for the evangelicals itself testifies to the bigger thing one of the things you often get with evangelical stories is again that there's a particular there's a particular story to tell you know that they've they've often been very committed in childhood and uh the teens you know they've been going twice on a sunday they've been going on wednesdays you know like the the, the church has been a very big part of their 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 family lives their social lives um and and therefore it's a much bigger deal um to leave and and still it is in terms of the family back home and and all sorts of ways in which this affects them currently the upbringing of their children for example then becomes quite a big family issue and that kind of stuff um i think one of the one of the big issues that um evangelicals mentioned that no one else did um was purity culture um evangelical women ex-evangelical women or at least of a certain age always cited purity culture as and, and always had some horror story to tell like some some awful anecdote or some uh you know youth minister who it then found out was having an affair with one of the the youths you know there was always this and one of the things i focus on um is this kind of hypocrisy element that that mm. often comes through in especially evangelical but also catholic accounts um and and why that is such a important um underminer of of religious kind of identity um so that's a particular thing you know the sex issues but particularly around kind of gender roles and women and the sort of how skewed at least they perceive it to have been to the focus on women's purity rather than boys purity um you know that's something that comes up again and again uh with you know former evangelicals and and not mentioned at all by i mean mormons to a certain extent but mainliners and catholics just wasn't this isn't a, a big deal they've got other big deals to talk about yeah to to, to name that hypocrisy that those things that you have seen that i would assume we're talking about sexuality in terms of ministers and falling falling from grace publicly yeah and i don't i don't suppose the politics has helped uh, particularly in a post-trumpian world no i mean the, the the trump issue is important no certainly in terms of the you know people are always citing you know some you know there's, there's plenty we could mention but you know some big evangelical kind of you know thought leader and mega church pastor and then you know some great fall from grace and 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 what they do is they tend to cite these as as, as kind of proving what they suspected all along about the, the 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 corruptness of the whole thing um 
And in terms of, yeah, the Trump thing's interesting because on the one hand, you might, there's a certain narrative that, you know, the, that it's driving people away from the evangelical church. And it doesn't actually seem to be the numbers. You know, there's no obvious kind of Trump effect to ex-evangelical non-version. Um, and I think what it probably is the case is that for a lot of people, um, it just confirms everything that they've always thought in, in, in the sense that, you know, the the certain segment of evangelicalisms allying itself to kind of mago Christianity just confirms everything that they already kind of knew. So it's not kind of adding a new reason to leave for those people. Um, but also, I suspect you, what, what the other effect is that it's probably keeping quite a lot of people in who would identify as nuns, but still identify as evangelical, despite not really practicing or uh, believing much because they like Trump. Um, you know, we, we often tend to forget, especially, you know, liberal sociologists, uh, you know, that people tend to forget that Donald Trump is very popular and won an election. And, <laughs> uh, and actually, yes, there's many people who were completely, you know, kind of turned off by that and burnt their bridges with uh, evangelicalism. But I think for others, it kept them in, not for religious reasons, but because of that cultural political thing. Um so, so yeah, but again, what you tend to see is that, you know, a lot of ex-evangelicals, you know, this wasn't the thing that made them leave, but it, it was just kind of one more nail in a, you know, a well-nailed coffin, I think. Um, some of this, some of this kind of, you know, the, the especially at the crazier end of things. You yeah. know, nothing would surprise us now kind of thing, you know. <laughs> well, you've mentioned that uh, the, the social dynamics have changed and created a climate where it is easier to come out, if you will, as a nonvert, as a nun. But I'm, I'm assuming that there are still challenges, cultural challenges that they face. Do things like the rise of the new atheists in the past and, and the coming together of the ex-evangelicals as a group, that they're starting to, to write more you know, for the culture? And do these serve as forms of identity and empowerment for these new forming groups? Yeah, I mean, there. I mean, I think identity uh, is, is an important thing. I mean, certainly. Uh, I mean, it's the big thing for ex ex Mormons is that there's this kind of, you know, if you were raised in rural Utah or rural uh, southern Idaho, you know, uh, and you had doubts, then you either just left, um, or you know, you didn't have doubts for very long because there was nowhere to kind of explore them or you know deepen them or talk to people about them. Um, once you get the internet, then suddenly there's this whole kind of world of thousands of people who were raised Mormon and also have these doubts, um, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and then are sending you links, you know, about, hey, did you ever hear about this in you know, seminary and that kind of stuff, you know. Um, so you get this real kind of community. And, and I think one of the one of the, the big arguments about the rise of the nons and, and particularly the sort of where the new atheism kind of, you know, it obviously touched some kind of latent uh, nerve in american society you know suddenly you get these you know surprised million selling books um was this kind of particularly online uh you know atheist activist identity politics kind of uh, groundswell um but obviously that differs from where you are in the country you know what, what i tended to find is when i was down in the south and again this is not surprising is that the the, the nons i interviewed in the south it tended to be a much bigger part of their their own identity, um, and they felt it more important to know others they could hang out with, um, and kind of let off steam and that kind of stuff. Um, whereas, you know, if you're you know if you're a, a millennial in New York, uh, you know, it's not a big deal at all. You know, except when you go back for Thanksgiving to Oklahoma or something like that. You know, like. It, for, for them, it would be like a weird thing if they were still going to church, you know, in the sort of professional milieus they're in. Um, so it really does differ that kind of salience of non-religiosity um, and the kind of uh, need to a band together with others, but also to kind of feel that this is something that we need to kind of suit up to to fight for. Um, you know, obviously, that's very diff different in Alabama than it is in Portland, Oregon. You know, that's for sure. <laughs> As a result of your research, did you come across uh, areas where you think we still have stereotypes and, and misunderstandings of the nuns and nonverts? 
Uh, yeah, I think there's all sorts of... I mean, I think one of the things that instantly leaps to mind, because that's an excellent question, is is science. Um, you know, we have this idea that atheists are all about science, um, partly because, you know, atheist books tend to be, you know, written by people who are very pro-science and often by very eminent scientists, okay? And, and there's this kind of, uh, you know, science-religion conflict thesis that, that Christians are very often... Um, uh, imbibed themselves so they kind yes. of assume that uh you know scientists are more likely to be atheists but also atheists are more likely to be very sciencey and, and some of them are i mean you do get this kind of very you know kind of philosophical materialist naturalist you know kind of very pro-science very kind of uh you know stem you know science engineering technology kind of worldview if you like um but actually again even among the atheist community you see you see there's a lot of um what you might call supernatural beliefs you know they may not believe in god but they might believe in in ghosts or they might believe in a clairvoyance or they might believe in astrology or they might believe in you know bigfoot or something like that i mean and, and actually there's a lot of that um yes, and, and one of the things i always cite is is uh, i don't know if you're familiar with the the history um channel's documentary documentary uh, ancient aliens um yes, oh, yes probably america's uh biggest documentary like most popular documentary it's on it's like 21st season or something like that um and i'm always struck um a you know this is a you know you you wouldn't get a a, a series commission that kind of went through you know the holy books of all the great religions and and gave a kind of a uh an ordinary naturalistic explanation of phenomena and, you know, how these texts got put together and how things get exaggerated over time. You know, I don't think you'd sell that to the history channel for might maybe a one-off special. Right. But if you do that, but say it's aliens, if, if the atheistic explanation is aliens, then you do. And, and it strikes me that ancient aliens is this kind of great carrier of, of atheism um into people's homes um but it obviously isn't the kind of the classic richard dawkins type of atheism right um there, there's this whole kind of uh alternative um types of atheism that are out there um you know that that that, that don't follow that stereotype that don't follow this kind of you know um very rationalistic uh respectably kind of rationalistic uh uh mold um yeah the, that whole interest in the paranormal was fascinating i've done a few programs yes. uh, with scholars on that and i found interestingly you can find an article by michael Shermer, the noted skeptic online where he wrote that for some atheists the the idea about aliens can function the way god functions for you know religious believers. So it's kind of a fascinating dynamic, which leads me to this, this next question. In, in what ways, it's interesting, I've even seen, I follow another group uh, on non-religious spirituality. You're even seeing people who would identify as atheists, who nevertheless recognize the value of what religion provides in terms of <clears throat> binding people together, community, these kinds of things. In what ways are people experimenting like the, with the paranormal, with alternative forms of spirituality? Yeah, no, this is something, you know, spirituality is one of those very broad categories um, that, you know, yes, can be tied more or less closely to traditional religious traditions. Um, but also it, it has this kind of very diverse life of its own. You know, spirituality is a category. Can I, I often think it's helpful to distinguish between kind of the hard end of uh, spirituality, which is kind of things like, you know, what we imagine is like astrology or tarot cards or, you know, people, um, you know, doing kind of Wicca practices or, um, you know, going to Reiki healers, you know, doing like shamanic retreat, you know, doing all that kind of uh, uh, the hard end stuff of, of, serious spirituality but actually what you tend to find is a lot of people who say they are spiritual um it, it 
it, it doesn't necessarily translate to that at all. It it, it is this kind of uh, they they don't like religious, whatever they mean by the term. They certainly don't think of themselves as atheists because again, even if they are atheists, they often say, "Yeah, but I don't I don't like the term atheist." So I guess technically I am one, but it their vision of what an atheist is is you know kind of um, you know as bad as the fundamentalists they'll often say. Um, and they like the word spiritual, and and it's often a kind of a vague uh, mishmash of uh, mindfulness, possibly not say so that you do it, but they kind of like the idea. Um, it's often just this kind of you often see it on kind of people on Facebook posts. They'll say, you know, we're thanking the universe for, you know, some good bit of luck for a new job or for bringing the two of us together. Um, you know sending good vibes kind of thing there is this kind of weekly enchantedness about the world um you know which doesn't necessarily mean that they're down at the you know that down at the eastland center in, in in california doing you know uh guided retreats and stuff which is that kind of 70s new age um spirituality which i think often comes to mind when we think of spirituality um, I think that it kind of there's a kind of a diffuseness and and a quite a weak cultural spirituality um, that a lot of people vaguely associate themselves with, but but aren't you know aren't kind of pursuing it in any kind of systematic or deep way. Well, I wonder if you would have any thoughts uh, as we bring our conversation to a close with this last question. Um, as churches start to respond to the nonverts and to the nuns, uh, I think it's important that it's, it's careful as to how they do that. I noticed that there was just a, a, some reporting recently in Religion News Service that Tim Keller has founded a Tim Keller Apologetics Institute. And yeah, the desire is to reach some of these nonverts. I, I am skeptical of the ability for them to do so. Because like with the Alpha course that you may be familiar with in the past, it was from the UK and came over to the US, we tend to, to ask Christian questions that we're interested in. And we think if we just answer those theological questions for people that they will naturally gravitate to the church. I think the nonverts are a very different phenomenon. The, as you say with these roles, these are exes. These aren't just prodigals who have kind of stepped away temporarily and we can move them, move them back. What kinds of considerations should... I'm not asking for a plan. I'm just saying what kinds of thoughts do they need to keep in mind about the reality of this challenging situation? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, the, the, the nonverts are, are much harder sell for Chris, you know, because these are people who have been there and done that. You know, I, I often cite there used to be a head and shoulders dandruff shampoo used to have a, a commercial in the, <laughs> the 90s that was you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Um, and, and I often think that with people who were either raised quite solidly religious or, or at least just raised in a very christian world you know this kind of uh um culturally christian backdrop um that it, it's then very difficult um for people who haven't embraced it um to, to then or have embraced it and then decidedly disengage from it um to, to then interest them in it again and it's not to say that that doesn't happen you know, there, there is a revert phenomenon. You, you you do hear these stories. And if you're in a church, then the the, the young people you'll meet to be the people who've come back, you know, so you kind of think that there's that's a, a more normal thing than it actually is. You get this kind of selection bias. Um, but, but it's a far harder sell, um, you know, to try and interest people about Jesus, you know, when they've they feel like they've they've heard enough about Jesus. Um, and, and the situation in, in Europe is is different in that it's becoming odder and odder to have had any kind of real connection to 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 any church um and, and so you're arguably beginning to get to a point where you know people can encounter christianity as something new um the the, the current situation in america really really isn't like that um it will change because the you know the the pattern will be that the cradle nons will become a bigger and bigger part of the pie over time. Um, but I think at the minute, um, you know, churches are obviously keen to kind of, we need to reach the nons and, you know, yes, they, they ought to be, it's, it's a growing mission field, but, but really the, 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 the bigger challenge is to, is to work out how can we um, create fewer nons in the future? Um, 
you know, and and that issue of transmission, that issue of um, what have we done? You know, these were very often believe in practicing people. Um, no amount of bringing in kind of you know the people we've had and left is going to make up for the numbers that we're currently losing. I mean, and and I think you know. Of course, churches, it's natural of them to be kind of, you know, bring back the, you know, however they frame this, you know, bring the prodigals back home or, you know, going off for the lost sheep, that kind of stuff. Um, but but the, 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 the bigger issue is to, to, to stop, um, stop losing so many sheep, I suppose, <laughs> to put it that way. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a huge challenge. And I just hope that we don't look at the ways of the past in a Christendom culture, I just don't think is going to work in a post Christendom, Christendom culture. I think we need to take these folks seriously and yeah. listen self critically if we can do that. And I think research like yours helps make that possible. Any uh, Anything else that I didn't get to that you think you'd like to see covered? Steve? No, not at all. I think we've been uh, we've covered a lot of ground. Wonderful. Again, I want to show folks here. Here's the cover of the book. You'll find it in the program notes, uh, a link in description. It's Nonverts, the Making of Ex-Christian America. My guest has been Stephen Bolivant. It's a wonderful book. And uh, check it out and read it and share it with your pastor and your church leadership. Stephen, thank you for coming on the program. It's a genuine pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. Until the next episode of Multi-Faith Matters, I'm the host, John Moorhead. Thanks to everybody for watching and listening.